All right, Paul, so we have a fairly elegant model that fits five different constraints, obeys the laws of physics, and we think works. But is there anything that we can do, or what predictions could it make that we can now test that wasn't originally there? Well, in the 1960s, some people, very smart people, actually figured out one possible test that was quite different. Okay. Now, you remember all these nuclear reactions we yep. talked about last time. What you would have seen is that in various occasions you get neutrinos flying out like this is yep. here and here, um, particularly from the first step or some of the later steps in some of the different chains. Now what's a neutrino? Well this is always the yep. interesting thing, right? Neutrinos are kind of like the, the forgotten cousins of the particle family. Uh, and neutrinos I think are always fascinating because, well, they're around us all the time. Basically a neutrino has as they then thought, no mass. We now, as we'll talk, come to in a yep. second, a very small mass. Um, no charge. Yep. Doesn't interact via the strong force, only interacts via a different force in nature called the weak force, yep. which, curiously enough, is weak. <laughs> Coincidentally. What this, <laughs> what this means is that neutrinos are the closest thing you can have to not being there at all and still be a particle. A neutrino can typically fly right through the Earth and out the other side without noticing. So it's not interacting with the strong nuclear force, so if it passes through us, it's not going to knock us off or destroy the bonds in our in body. In fact, right now as we stand here, neutrinos in large numbers are flooding through both our bodies and we don't notice. So there are f these things flooding through us that are part of this nuclear fusion reaction uh, and they're constantly coming from nuclear fusion reactions inside the sun? And this was the idea that uh, people thought about, that these neutrinos are being produced in that middle 25% of the sun and because they are such slippery customers, they can get all the way out. They don't have to fight their way through the rest of the sun. They can go straight from the middle 20% or so right to the Earth. So they don't have to wait that 10,000 year journey these photons do. They can escape in eight minutes or so? That's right, travelling at the speed of light. And they should be... Well, the trouble is if they just fly through the Earth and don't have any effect, uh, that's not going to be very useful. But while the interaction is weak, it's not non-existent they do interact very, very slightly with matter. And this experiment, the uh, Homestake experiment, uh, buried down a very deep mine in Canada, was meant to find these things. So what they're trying to do is to say, all right, well, there is some sort of very small reaction that we can't feel in our body, we can't see, doesn't detect anything else, but we, they can build something that does. So what do they build? Well, they put it down a mine shaft because if they put a detector on the surface, it's going to get completely overwhelmed by all the other forms of radiation. On oh, the right, because there's light, there's all these other... Cosmic sort of rays, things. all sorts of things. So, so you put it down a deep mine because basically only neutrinos are going to make it through a kilometre of rock to get to this Because thing. they're the only thing that can pass through it. So you yes. essentially have the Earth shielding everything else, and only these pesky, slippery customers make it through. And what they have is basically a 300 cubic metre tank of dry cleaning fluid. Okay. Per chloroethylene. And all we really care about is it's got chlorine in that. Okay. And the idea is that every so often a neutrino will hit a chlorine molecule and convert it into a different isotope of argon. So what you're saying is because you, you have so much chlorine in here, even though they're passing through and the chance is small, if you stack enough of it, you're going to get a few of these reactions. And basically out of these trillions upon trillions upon trillions of trillions of chlorine molecules, after about a week, maybe about 20 of them, it's a very, 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 very small fraction, would have been hit by a neutrino from the sun and converted into radioactive argon. So they can, de they can detect this new radioactive argon emits all this what chlorine. What they do is every, basically every week or so they would bubble helium through the entire thing and the helium would collect all this radioactive argon mm -hmm. and pass it out and because it's radioactive it will decay and produce things that they can measure because uh, even a few atoms of radioactive stuff can be picked up. That's right. So even though it's an incredibly microscopically unbelievably small fraction it can be picked up. And I guess even though if you get 20, but if you do 20 and you get 20 per week, run it for a few weeks, a few months, a few you years. You get some good statistics. Yeah. So they did the experiment, expecting to see a certain number of these things coming out from the sun, and did the model pass the test? Well, this the is a big was, question, right? The answer was no. They were picking up too few neutrinos. So the, but, but, Three but it did, times too few. But it did work. They picked up some. They did pick up. There were neutrinos going through here. 
uh, but they were about three times too little compared to what you expect from the sun. And they measured enough? They did this a long enough time? Well, of course, when they got this result, they immediately thought, well, maybe there's something wrong with our solar model. Maybe we can tweak it somehow, yep. make the middle of the sun a bit cooler, or maybe we can, something's wrong with our calibration of our lab experiment. And over the years and decades that followed, they looked really closely at all these things, and they just couldn't see what the discrepancy was. As they got better and better data, it seemed more and more solid that they were only picking up a third as many neutrinos. So the model doesn't work? Yeah, so what's happening in the middle of the sun? I mean, it's not producing neutrinos that need to be to producing the energy that we see according to the reactions we understand. One idea is actually maybe the sun had gone out uh -huh. because the light we see from the sun could have come out from 10,000 years ago. If the sun had gone out in the last 10,000 years, you wouldn't see anything visibly. Yep. But the neutrinos have dropped out. But after lasting billions of years, the sun would suddenly drop out in the last 10,000 years. That seems kind of unlikely. And there's no physical principle we know that could do that. <laughs> so maybe all our careful modeling is complete crap. But there was a possibility yeah. that came out of particle physics as well. Because no one likes to think all their theories are complete crap. That's There's, right. Heaven knows it's happened to both of us enough times, I think. You, you've got to, as a, a scientist, you've got to be prepared to accept that your theory might be wrong. and Even if it's a geologist or a particle physicist. <laughs> and, and move on if need be. Um, unlike politicians, we can actually admit when we're wrong and move on. That's right. Um, but there was one possibility. Now, people thought the neutrino had no mass. Yep. But it turned out if the neutrino had a very small mass, there are actually three different types of neutrinos, actually called flavours. Yep strawberry, vanilla, and chocolate. <laughs> um, but it turns out that this detector was only capable of picking up one of the three flavors. Oh, so wait. So if there's three flavors, and we can only detect one. Now, the model already allowed for that. OK. Because the samples should be producing the same one that was picked up here. Yeah. But if they had a very small mass, it turns out that as the neutrinos fly, they would change flavor. They'd rotate between flavor one, flavor two, flavor three, and back again. So your chocolate can turn to vanilla. Yes. Okay. And, tr and strawberry and then come back again. So by the time the neutrinos arrive at the Earth, one third of them will still be the sort that this thing can detect, but two thirds will have changed into the other two types. Oh, so the amount leaving isn't the amount arriving. Of that one type of That's neutrino. Right. There'll still be the same number of neutrinos hitting this, but two thirds of them will have changed into the other two flavors. So if you account for that these neutrinos for very interesting reasons can mutate or change, and you didn't account for that in your original budget, you would be detecting two-thirds less. Which is exactly what you're detecting. So that would solve this problem, but at the expense of introducing a whole new bunch of neutrinos have to have mass, which is not the simplest model of particle physics. No, but so how do we go about solving this? Well, this converting um, chlorine to argon only pick up one sort, but there is a type of interaction which can pick up all these sorts. It's called Cherenkov radiation. Hmm. So Cherenkov radiation basically you know about sonic booms. If yep. a plane travels faster than sound, it produces a sonic boom, ba bang which is why you don't get Concorde flying over <laughs> cities. The same thing applies for light. If something can travel faster than light, it produces a light boom. So, and obviously, light particles leaving the sun travel at the speed of light. Well, normally nothing can go faster than light. Yep. But you can slow light down inside a dense material, like, for example, a tank full of water. So light and water are traveling about 40% slower than normally. Yep. But particles are limited by the speed of light in a vacuum. Okay. So what that means is normally you can't go faster than light, but if you're in a dense thing like a water tank, a particle can go faster than light in the water tank. Because the light is slowed down, not necessarily that the others are speeding up. That's right. And this causes the, sometimes it's a bluish or a greenish glow, normally bluish, you see around nuclear reactors. This is a, a spent fuel tank at a nuclear reactor, and you see this blue glow is Cherenkov radiation. There's radiation coming out from there, and as it flies through the water, it's going faster than light can go in the water, and producing light sonic booms, so-called Cherenkov radiation, which is producing the blue glow. And neutrinos can, in principle, do the same thing, or precisely, they can knock an electron out of something and the electron yeah. produces it. So you can look for neutrinos, which escape at the speed of light, slowing down in these tanks and producing this reaction. The neutrino would hit something, and the thing it knocks out would go faster than light and produce a brief flash of Cherenkov radiation. Yeah, okay. Very faint. So what you'd need is a whopping great tank of ultra-purified water deep underground so no other form of radiation can meet it. Kamio Kanda. Yeah, Super Kamakanda, which is deep under a mine in Japan. And it's an enormous great tank. You can see that's a boat with some people at the bottom there. Um, normally it's full of water, but every now and then they empty the water out and then go to fix all these big things on the wall, which are photomultiplier tubes. Okay. This is basically an electric uh, vacuum tube that uh, light goes in 
produces an electron at the front, and the electron is accelerated to produce a pulse of electricity. So pretty much uh, kind of similar to how we used to use these on telescopes. Yes, and just as fragile. <laughs> so these are capable of picking up a single photon of light. So the idea would be that when it's full of water, a neutrino can come in, produces a flash of Cherenkov radiation, and all that will produce a little flash of light, and that will be picked up by some of these photomultiplier tubes. And then if you have a bunch of them, you get a whole bunch of bright flashes. And the crucial thing about this is all three flavors of neutrinos will produce this ah, radiation. So not you just don't one. have to see if it's this factor of them changing or missing them because you're changing. You should see all of them. So they should see exactly the right amount of neutrinos. Now, they had a number of problems. One big problem they had was that what, every now and then one of these photomultiple tubes would explode. This is a common thing. These are high voltage vacuum systems. Um, Sounds like a pretty big problem. The trouble was, if one exploded, they expected a certain number to explode and yeah. they assumed that every few years they'd go in and fix those. But what happened is when it exploded, the sh fragments from it hit the neighboring ones and caused them to explode, <laughs> which then led to a chain reaction, <laughs> which destroyed the vast majority of these things. So they created their own reaction in the chamber. <laughs> yes, but anyway, they fixed them all, came up with some stronger photomultiplier tubes, and they were finally able to do the experiment, as was another team, using yeah. a different technique. So this was repeated two times. But basically, what they discovered was three times more neutrinos that have been picked up by the Homestake experiment. So they found that there was three flavors of neutrinos, and even if these neutrinos leaving the sun can change their different flavors, they are still detecting all of those flavors. Yes, and so, huge great relief from the stellar modelers that the model of the sun actually survives the test. To this begin with, it failed. It was three times out, but it turned out that the problem was due to neutrinos changing flavor and not due to astronomers stuffing up the model of the sun. So it really confirmed another important aspect of physics. Yes. So in fact, they made a big discovery. So, so not only was the model right, but they made a new discovery. I think that's a pretty good one. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. You see people in an in a undergraduate laboratory, if their experiment doesn't give the right answer, it's, oh, no. But for us, when an experiment doesn't give the right answer, it's, yay, <laughs> that's a clue for something good. Exactly. And in this case, a pretty big one, which won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. That's right. Uh, so we have a test. We can look right into the middle of the sun with neutrinos. And after a few wobbles along the way, uh, the solar model actually passes this test with flying colors. So first one, done. Tick.